month is a time to celebrate and recognize the Republicans contribute the important contribution of Canadian of Asian descent to the growth and development of Canada. It's also a time to honor the diverse traditions, histories, and experience of the Asian community. He commends all of you for organizing this event to promote intercultural sharing and understanding through the arts. Now I think some of you are anxious and waiting for the talk, Millennial and Diversity by Justin Poy. Before doing that, Justin will also talk briefly about Dr. Neville Poy's pictures being displayed tonight. Justin, please. So I don't actually want to speak too long and bore everybody, but this is, uh, this is actually a topic that um, I've become increasingly um, aware of, and, uh, and, and I like to think of it through the Asian context. I don't know how many of you here have, uh, are in marketing or have experience in marketing or sales or employ staff. How many here employ what we would call millennials? Oh, wow. Okay, Stephen. Uh, you know, uh, they make up a majority of our workforce now. Um, the oldest millennials will be the, in their uh, early 30s. And uh, we're already starting to call the younger generation in their teens something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting because millennials, when it comes to millennials, there's two sides to the argument. If you talk to a millennial and you say, you know what, you are 31 years old, you still live in your parents' basement, and you don't have a job that actually pays a real income. And their answer will be, well, that, you know, cost of living is very expensive in Toronto or, or in most urban cities, which is true. It's very expensive to buy a property. Um, and the problem is, you know, and, and I'm not saying that I'm about to present a solution, but there's, it's a multifaceted problem. If you look at many um, companies that used to hire and employ full-time staff, they don't anymore. They put everybody on a contract. They limit the hours just so it's barely enough so that they don't have to actually pay them any benefits. You know, so is it a wonder that millennials are a little bit bitter at, the, uh, at those that employ them? Um, but every time I do hear about the topic of millennials, either selling to millennials, because they're a very big consumer market as well, um, I never hear of it in the context with looking through it uh, from an Asian lens. And when I say Asian lens, I'm talking about all our subcultures within the continent of Asia. One thing that, I was at an automotive conference, a marketing conference, and there was a millennial panel. And there were four people up on stage. Nobody, and there was no uh, ethnic representation on the stage. And somebody came to me afterwards, and it was a South Asian gentleman. And he said, you know, I came here with my parents. I'm the only child, and I'm not entitled. I worked so hard to help to pay the mortgage. I work so hard to make sure that one day I can actually make my parents proud. If we look at some of the millennials that come from China, for example, most millennials actually would have all been born during the one-child policy. So they would be the only child of their family. So some of them, a lot of them, when they come here, they get jobs. There's a lot that's riding on their shoulders. There's a lot of dreams and hopes that their parents have for that child. So I don't necessarily like the idea that we sort of cast everything under one name or call millennials. One thing we do know, though, is in the baby boomer and the generation X um, uh, uh, periods, ownership has changed. When we're trying to sell things to millennials, you notice millennials don't own anything anymore. When we were kids, you grew up thinking, I will eventually save some money, I will buy a house, I will buy a car and it's been, I'm going to drive for 20 years and I'm going to look after it. Now, everything is just like the cell phone. You pay a fee to use it, but you don't actually want to own it. So, they rent a lot, they don't consider buying cell phones, they don't buy cars. That's why we see all these disruptive technologies like Zipcar, AutoShare, Uber. How many people here use Uber? Wow, really? Okay, you got to hang out with some 30-something. 
Uber is incredible. If you actually use Uber, you pull out your phone, a black car, town car, SUV, any kind of car will pull up right here, and you can actually see them on the map and time how long they will get here right at the front door. Now, when you have that kind of service, why would you actually want to buy a car? So, what we've learned from, and same thing with technology and the internet, we're used to things instantly. I remember when you would have a debate with somebody, and they say, really? Is that true? And then you'd have to actually wait till the next day until somebody looked it up. Now, people just pull out the phone and they can just prove you right there. There's no more, there's no more making a bet. You know, or you have to refer to the Encyclopedia Botanica collection that you had at home. So, you know, things have really changed. Um, I don't know that necessarily that people have changed, but I can say that, um, you know, I, I do hear a lot of negativity about the next generation. But think about it. I'll leave you with this. Every generation, if you actually look up old Time Life magazines, during the 60s, everybody thought that, every parent thought that a Beatles fan was going to turn out to be a reject. Every parent in the 70s thought that their long-haired kid with a, a beard, bell bottoms, and ripped jeans was going to end up being nothing. In fact, those all ended up being our leaders. So, um, during this Asian Heritage Month, when you uh, go to various events, not just our events, but there's so many events across the country if you're traveling, um, try to not only look at different cultures, but maybe also look at the next generation within the lens of the Asian cultures that uh, make up all of us. Because I think you'll find that they're actually quite unique and quite different from what we experience here exclusively in North America. Now, I'm not the photographer, but back here um, are some photographs by Dr. Neville Poy, who is uh, my father and also Ashley Poy's father. Ashley is my brother, and you're going to hear from him later. Um, for those of you who are familiar with my father's work, uh, my father and Stephen have been friends for many years, and they're both avid photographers. Um, my, my father has, um, uh, he has done some published works. Uh, before, but he uh, he's primarily a hobby photographer. He travels extensively, and he tries to capture um, uh, scenes and color, um, how light reflects on water, um, how you know the, the perspectives that he takes are, are very unique. And um, so I invite you to look at his collection. Um, he is actually going to be um, presenting uh, a collection. Um, in a couple of weeks on exclusively on India. I believe some of his pictures from India are here, but he's taken some pictures from Tibet, from China, uh, from all over the United States. Um, mostly landscapes, but very often people. He, he has an uncanny ability to just catch people uh, when they're doing nothing. I guess he's very far away with a, a telephoto lens. But um, uh, I hope you'll enjoy it.